me just kind of connect some dots with you on some things that we've been talking about as a church family. You know, we, as we move into this identity of being citizen church, one of the things that we've been slowing down and looking at is the mission of this body, this church. Why do we exist? Why do we gather together on Sundays? Why do we come together as a church? We've been talking about the mission. We've been talking a bit about vision, our opportunity to make a difference in the community, in the city around us. We believe that church is not just for us, but it's also through us that we can make a difference. And so we've been talking also about our values. And I want to lean into one of those values that we touched on just a couple of weeks ago. And I want to help to paint a picture for a few minutes. And so you may know that when Jesus comes, he flips the script. He turns everything upside down and he begins to say, listen, there's a new way of living, of reacting, of treating each other, of responding to one another. And Jesus would come along and he says, I'm going to give you a brand new command. And what's that command? And let's read this second part together. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Let's try that one more time. Okay. One, two, and three. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. We've talked about this idea that we would love like Jesus. What a beautiful picture that is. The way that God would love us unconditionally. The way that he would even lay down his life for us. That's what we'll celebrate over the next couple of weeks. That God would demonstrate his love by laying down his life. You and I are to love like Jesus. And this is a beautiful picture of how we would engage each other support each other, stand next to one another. And Jesus would say that I modeled it and now it's your turn. You go and live this out. And so as he lays this out, here's what he says. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So here's Jesus painting this picture, a new commandment I give you to love one another and that you would be known by Love. This is what would change the world. This is the way that Jesus would make a lasting impact even all these years later. And so when we see this value and we're known by our love for each other, how can it be, how can it be this simple? How can it seemingly be so uncomplicated, but yet at the same time be complicated? See, you and I, we were designed for community. This is a value we talk about often. We were designed to be in relationship, that we would love each other, support each other, encourage one another, build one another up. We were designed to be a community in unity, that there would be something that unites us together, that holds us as a collective. And we see that Jesus would say that this love, this serving this way of being united will become the defining characteristic of his church and it would look different than the world around us and in fact we see that as the early church starts they do such a beautiful job of this don't they of being united of having this common thing within them that helps them to love and to serve it helps them to support one another there's a beautiful picture in the very beginning but how long would it last? How long would we have a community in unity? How long before, well, before differences would start to become divisions? If you just looked at the early church, the one that started off so well in Acts chapter one and Acts chapter two, just a couple of chapters later in the early church, we see that division begins to come in. We see that even within the church, that God would say, to love one another, a community that should be known by its unity. What was once united now becomes divided. We see this in early church, but we see this in everyday life, don't we? Have you ever experienced a relationship that was once united, but now feels divided? Have you ever maybe had a, a friendship with someone and, and there was a point in time when, man, you guys were inseparable, Like you saw things the same way, you walk the same, talk the same, maybe even dress the same, but something somewhere, somebody got offended, somebody said something, 
somebody did something. Something came between you two and what was once united now feels divided. Have you ever had a friendship go sour? What about division in relationship? Maybe, maybe inside of your family. Have you ever had a relationship with a family member? Like a mom or a dad, a son or a daughter? Have you ever had a relationship where it came time for Thanksgiving dinner and it's, it's really difficult to sit across the table with somebody that you're supposed to be united with, but you feel so divided and it's hard to know how to love them well and now you're not sure what to do with it? Have you ever even been in maybe, maybe your marriage relationship and you stood at an altar and dreamed of the rest of your days being in perfect alignment and harmony, but now something, something feels like it's come between you. It's dividing you, and you're not sure what to do with it. Have you ever had a relationship go bad? What was once united now feels divided. See, this is universally true for us, that even though that we're supposed to love one another, why does this happen? How does it happen? It's because when you and I are in relationship with each other, there's a common characteristic. We're imperfect people. What do we know about imperfect people? They disappoint. They let you down. Sometimes they have the ability to hurt you. But it's not just them, is it? Sometimes it's, we're the ones who are on the offending end. Sometimes we say something that I wish, I wish I could get a take back. You ever found yourself wanting to cram the words back in your mouth? You ever wish you got a do over? You did something that was dumb. And now it's kind of drawn this wedge between you and somebody you care about in relationship. We see that what was once united, can so easily become divided. And when things like this happen, especially in our closest of relationships, there's a path, there's a response that many people inside of culture will choose to take. And sometimes up front, it feels a little easier to just, maybe to just burn the bridge, maybe to just walk away. Maybe it would be easier to just pretend like it didn't happen but every time you run into each other at the grocery store now, it's really awkward. It used to be BFFs, and now you barely talk. Inside of your marriage, it's gone to a cold silence. Something has grown. It has festered. It has sat in between you. There's an offense. Something has lodged its way in there. There's a response that the world often takes, and it's to simply walk away when it gets challenging. What was once united could be so easily divided but the response that the world takes, it can't be the response that if you're a Christ follower, that you take, that I take. If you and I are going to be a church that's built on God's love for one another, then there are going to be times if we do life with one another long enough, when you and me, we may disagree. There are going to come moments when maybe even in this room with somebody that you're sitting next to, that you serve alongside on a team, there are going to be moments when a church community is not in unity because you and me can disagree. We can see things differently. We can experience the same circumstance and have different opinions and viewpoints. You and I, we can be in relationship and yet we can feel divided and not so united. How we respond here, it matters. What you and I do inside the church, what you and I do as believers, as Christ followers, as Christians, how we respond when things are difficult in relationship, when we feel more divided than united, how we respond says something significant, something significant about you, but also something significant to the world around you. What do we do when you and I, when we disagree? 
Here's what you need to know, and this is a, 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 probably something, a concept that you may not even know came from Scripture, but here it is in Mark. It says that if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot, it cannot stand. If this kingdom of God, that you and I were citizens of another kingdom, We've been talking about the last few weeks of what it looks like to belong to the kingdom of God. Here's what we need to know, that if we disagree yet can't stand in unity and we become divided, we cannot, we cannot stand. And if a house, a congregation, if a church, if your family is divided against itself, that house will not be able to Stand. This is what you and I need to know. You've probably heard before. Maybe it rolls around in here, but has it changed here? This is what you and I need to know. This is what your enemy already knows. Do you know that not everything that comes to divide us is what it seems like on the surface level? Did you know that there is actually an enemy of your family, of our church, that there's the devil, there's Satan, Lucifer, and we see throughout scripture his tactic is simple, is to divide and conquer. Do you know that he knows that this is true? That if I can simply divide your marriage, put one against the other, if I can drive a wedge into your family, father against son, if I can somehow get into the middle and I can begin to divide, I can much easily come behind and conquer. This is what the enemy of your soul already knows. When your house is divided, it cannot stand. It comes tumbling down. And I just want to, I don't know if you noticed this, but do you feel the polarization happening in culture around us? Every time you flip through your TV, every time there's something that's political, every time that there's something that's racial, every time there's something about gender. I was watching just yesterday and I saw that, you know, we can't ever agree on anything politically, like anything, right? It's red versus blue always divided, never united. We finally, there was like a TikTok band thing that was floating around. I don't know if you saw this or not. And I thought to myself, how can we not unite on anything else into this one thing you can somehow see how to agree? We are polarized within our culture. And it comes from media. It comes into our households, through our community, black versus white. This polarization, is, it's popular in every conversation that's going on. Our neighbors, you find out your neighbor has a different viewpoint than you. In our relationships, we can't sit down at the table and talk about things because of how polarizing it might feel. How we respond says a lot about us when you and I disagree when we have these polarizing conversations, when it feels like we're being torn apart. And so what do we do? Well, Jesus would paint this picture in, in John chapter 17, and he gives a prayer request. He actually begins to, to pray, God, this is something that I'm asking you for. I always find it interesting when Jesus, like he has a prayer request, like Jesus, son of God, you had a request. When Jesus begins to present that request, I want to show you what this looks like. Jesus says that my prayer is not for them alone, not for those who are just hearing this in this moment, but I also pray for those who will believe, future tense, maybe even generations down the road, maybe even you and I. Jesus begins to say, I'm not just praying for those in this moment of time, I'm also praying for those into the future, that he's praying for you and for I. He prays for those who will hear this message. And in 21, he says this, that all of them, what's Jesus's prayer? What is he asking the father for? That they may be, that they may be one, that they may be 
united, not divided. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. He says that you and I can be different. We can look different, walk different, talk different. But we have something within us that unites us. That thing that unites us is even deeper than what I would experience with biological family. Do you know what it is that unites us? Is that you and I have the Holy Spirit of God within us. If you are a Christ follower, you've trusted Jesus to come into your life, then you have the Holy Spirit of God. And it's the same Holy Spirit that's inside of you, that's inside of me, that's inside of you, and inside of you. We have the same spirit of God. And Jesus begins to pray, make my people, make my church. It's almost as if he could see the polarization, the temptation for division. And he could see into a moment like this, which such, such tearing apart. And he could offer a prayer that you and I might look different, but we can respond in unity because of something that unites us, because of the love of Christ within us. And so he prays, Father, make them one. Let them be one church. Let them have one heart. Let them have one purpose. Let them love one another. And I love how he says this as he goes on. He says in verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. And in 23, I and them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. I and them and you and me. Why? For complete unity. It's God's heart, God's design, his desire that you and I would be a community in complete unity. That even though there are places we, we may not see eye to eye, where we may even have places where we disappoint, miss the mark, what do we do how do we respond? Why does it matter? Here's what he says. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This becomes the picture to the world around us. It's easy to love one another when we're lovable. It's easy to be in unity when we see everything exactly the same. Jesus' prayer was a requirement as we'll see inside of the New Testament, Paul would have to speak to it as a requirement. Why? Because the temptation is always to let division get in. So how do we do this? How do we begin to become the fulfillment of Jesus's prayer that we might be one? The early church didn't always get this right. And let me show you how Paul addresses this. This is what he says in Ephesians. He says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another. You see how bearing implies the idea that there's, there's a disturbance, there's something, there's a tension that exists. Bearing with one another in love, eager, and here's what he says, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit, the bond of peace. This is an ESV. I love the way NIV also says this. Here's what he says. He says, make every effort. I love that. Make every effort as much as it is up to you with all the strength that you have. Make every effort to, to do what? To keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort to be in complete unity. Now, what does that mean? Unity doesn't mean that we're all going to think the same way all the time. In fact, there's a beautiful thing about having different viewpoints, isn't there? It doesn't mean that we're always going to see eye to eye. It doesn't mean that we'll always agree politically. It doesn't mean that we won't disappoint one another, that there won't be gaps, there won't be expectations that go unmet. Being in complete unity does not mean that we are perfect but it does mean that how we love each other can be complete. And so how do we do this? How do we make every effort? He says, make every effort to keep, uh, 
effort to keep the unity through the bond of peace. And then in Ephesians 4 and 31, he says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Get rid of. If you and I are going to be in unity, if we're going to love like Jesus loved, why would we have to get rid of? Because I can't love you and slander you. I can't love you and allow there to be bra- or, uh, tension between us. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And so you and I, if we're to love like Jesus, what does it require of us? I want to give you just a few simple things. And these are very practical, but for me, they changed my relationship with my wife. For me, they changed my relationship as a pastor. How do we make every effort to keep the unity? I want to show you these few ways. First, it starts right here. We start in the heart. It's really easy when there's disappointment, when there's letdown, when there's frustration, when there's unmet expectation, it is really easy for me to begin to point the fingers at everybody else. It's really easy for us to see the faults in someone else. But what if we would start in the heart? What if when there is a tension between one of us or in a group in our church, what if, what if we would start in the heart? And Paul says that what causes fights and quarrels amongst you, don't they come from desires that battle within you? What causes these tensions? What are the things that are dividing and separating you? More often than not, what you'll find is there's something that didn't go the way that you thought it should. Somebody didn't say something the way that you thought. They didn't respond. They forgot about. And we assume that they're always at fault. What if there's something that we could start within, start in the heart? First thing that we do to make every effort is you start in the heart. Here's another thing, and I want to spend a little bit more time on this one, and this will help you, is choose trust over suspicion. Choose trust over suspicion. And I got this from another pastor, and this helped me out. Game changer. That every one of us, when there's a moment when we can either choose to trust or be suspicious of someone, we have this different relationship with trust. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can be naturally suspicious. It's not as easy to trust somebody else. I don't know about you, but sometimes we're kind of wired that way, analytical. You're thinking through, can I trust? Should I not trust? Sometimes you're just hardwired. Sometimes life circumstances kind of erode trust. Somebody hurt you, wronged you, and now you've, you've built up this place where it's difficult to be in relationship, to trust other people. Every time that there's something where there's a gap in expectation, when you said something, but it didn't go down that way, you were supposed to, but I haven't seen it yet. Every time we have this gap that exists in these unmet expectations, when there's unexplainable gaps, here's what I need you to know, is what we expect people to do and what they actually do, there's a gap that exists. And every time you're going to make a decision, you're going to choose, what are you going to put in that gap? You're going to ask the question, well, is this something that is just part of who they are? Like this person, I don't trust them. And therefore I make an assumption that they, they intended to hurt me. They don't care about me. We overlook things because we become more suspicious of them. When there's these unexplainable gaps, we fill something in there. We get to choose between inserting trust or we get to choose between leaning into suspicion. How do you choose and what do you choose? There's this famous place within weddings. I just officiated a wedding here a couple weeks ago. And there's a famous verse that we often quote. And it starts talking about how to love like Jesus. It defines love for us. It's 1 Corinthians 13. No doubt you've read this one. There's a line here towards the end that I want us to get to. So as we love like Jesus, this is what it looks like. It's patient even when we disagree. It, it's kind even when I see things differently. It, it does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. 
It's not going to dishonor and tear down and rip down. It's not self-seeking. doesn't put my desires above yours. It's not easily angered. That's a difficult one sometimes. It keeps no record of wrong. <laughs> sometimes we simply are building cases against one another, aren't we? Bro, I've got a list, and every time I'm suspicious, I'm writing something down, and now I'm starting to build a case, an argument. And you know what I'm going to do with it? At just the right moment, I'm going to frame this thing up. I'm going to load it up, and right in the thick of argument, I'm going to unload my list. Because that's what we do when we're suspicious rather than trusting. It, scripture says that if we're to love like Jesus, then it's not going to keep this record of wrong. It's not taking delight just because they got what's coming to them, but it rejoices in the truth. It always protects. Here it is. It always trusts. It leans into trust. It offers hope, always perseveres. And so many times when there's this gap between what I expect and what I begin to experience, this is the decision that I choose to make. This is the decision that I would hope that we could make as a church. You're going to do life with each other long enough that there are going to be moments when there will be a gap in your expectation, even of me, or maybe with you, or maybe with somebody that you serve with. Let's make it personal for your house. Sometimes there's a gap between husband and wives and what you expect the other to do, how they should respond. When I lean into trust, I fill that gap with saying, you know what, in this moment, I don't have all of the information. I don't know all of the details. I know that they're for me. I know that they love me. And therefore, there must be something that has come up that I simply don't understand yet. I'm going to look for understanding. I'm going to fill the gap with trust. And here's why we do this together as a community. This is so important. Here's what we do with one another. If there's a gap and there's some suspicion that's grown, I'm going to come to your defense. Somebody else fills the gap with suspicion. This is how we protect unity. This is how we stay within community and not let the enemy get wedged into the middle of our relationships. And so when there is a gap that exists, my role and your role as part of a Christian community that's together in unity is to bring people together, to point people towards God, to help us stay united. It's when there's slander or gossip or the temptations for those kind of things to tear each other down that we instead build one another up. And that every time I'm going to make a decision, I'm going to come to your defense. I want you to come to my defense. And here's what you need to know, though, is in relationship, we don't just pretend like something doesn't happen. We do talk about it. We have an oxymoron of a value here that says that we will fight for unity, which means we will do the difficult thing of sitting down and talking through even challenging conversations. Why? It's because this is how we love one another. If I just pretend and think that it might just go away, it just gets awkward. We just grow cold in relationship. But when we will do the difficult work of sitting and talking and growing and gaining understanding, if what I experience begins to erode my trust, I'll come directly, not to everyone else, not to create more gossip, not to go and talk about you behind your back. If you are a Christ follower and a Christian, this becomes the pr approach laid out in Matthew 18. We go directly. We have the conversation. Why do we do that? Because this is what love like Jesus looks like. Amen. You and I aren't always going to agree. You're not always going to agree with your neighbor. We fill the gaps with trust and we talk about it when things get difficult. Now, to be a part of a community, you need to extend trust. but You also need to be trustworthy. You need to extend trust. I'm going to afford trust to you even when I don't have all of the answers yet. But at the same time, I should be trustworthy. It does not mean flawless. It does not mean perfect. 
but it does mean that I'm doing my best to walk with integrity, to let be my yes be yes and no be no. And if and when there are gaps, because there will be gaps, I will be accountable to those gaps. You should be accountable to those gaps. If you volunteer here at the church, and yes, I'm going to be present, but then something changes, you should communicate. Why? Because this is part of building trust, is being accountable. If you and I are struggling, then we are communicate. We have accountability with one another. And so this is how we do this in relationship. Why? Because loving like Jesus requires that we have a level of trust and that we are trustworthy. Let me give you a final thing. Is that we build bridges, not barriers. You and I build bridges, not barriers. If we're to love like Jesus, and we know there are going to be moments that come between us, things that could potentially divide us, but we are the person who doesn't burn bridges. We don't walk out on relationship. Just because things get a little difficult does not mean I stop attending, I stop showing up. We build bridges. Do you know what it means? It means sometimes you're gonna have to go first. It means sometimes there's gonna be a gap, there's gonna be a disappointment, there's gonna be a frustration, there's gonna be an unmet expectation. And instead of letting the gap continue to grow and divide, instead of you walking out or pretending like it did not happen, you're a bridge builder. It means that I'm gonna to come to you first. I'm gonna make the effort. It means I'm gonna pick up the phone and I'm gonna call you, hey man, Maybe we could sit down and talk about, it means that I'm going to go first because I'm going to start in my own heart. Hey, if I've offended you in any way, I just want to ask for your forgiveness. Sometimes it means it's building a bridge and it's extending grace towards someone. Sometimes it's you going first and asking forgiveness. We build bridges, not barriers. We don't build barriers of things in our heart that keeps me from loving you. I don't let something grow inside of me that just continues to become more and more awkward over time. You and I, if we're Christ followers, if we're gonna be a part of a church community that stands united and not divided, then it means that we will start in our heart, we'll make every effort to choose trust and we'll build bridges, not barriers, so that we might love like Jesus. And I wonder, I wonder if we did this within our own homes, with our spouses, if we did this with our children. I wonder if we were truly united and not divided across the dinner table. I wonder how things might be different. I wonder if inside of our church family, instead of going the route of so many bodies and letting things come and divide you, to separate you, that we might actually be strengthened by our differences. I wonder what it would look like when Jesus prays, the Father, make them one, just as we are one, for us to have one church, one mission, one heart, what would that look like? And how would it change the world? This morning, here's how, what I want to say. Is every divided heart longs to be united. Every heart that has experienced the pain of relationship. And you can act tough and put on a callous front. Hey, that doesn't bother me. That was a long time ago. When a relationship that God designs for unity within community becomes fractured, there is a piece of your heart that always longs for what was divided to become united. Amen. Amen. Wherever you are experiencing this, in your family, one of your friends, somebody at work, what if you truly loved them like Jesus 
unconditionally? What if you would do the difficult thing of looking to understand by choosing trust? What if you truly went to them even this week and you sought to build a bridge? Hey, I know we've had our differences, but I'm here to say I love you. I'm for you. I know, we, I know we've had our beef, but I just want to ask for your forgiveness. I know things went a little bit south, but what if we did that? What if you did that this week? What's been divided longs to be united. And some of you are here in the room and you're divided, not just this way, but you're divided from a heavenly father. This is actually the whole reason that we're about to celebrate Easter is all of us were divided from our relationship with God. All of the unmet expectations, all of our disappointing decisions, all of our ways of rejecting God, those things, well, they divided us from what we were meant to be. And that was to be in community with a heavenly father who loves you, who is for you, who adores you. And he built the bridge. He went first. He showed up. Even when you were still stiff arming, even when you were still sinning, and he loved you and he gave his life for you. And so we love like Jesus unconditionally. We love because he went first. And if you're here in the room or you're watching online and, and you still feel divided from your heavenly father, there's an easy way to be united. It simply begins with a confession. God, I've messed up. I've sinned. I've made some bad choices along the way. And I know those things divided me from you. But today I'm praying and I'm asking for the strength and the courage to do something differently, to begin to trust you in a way that I haven't, to begin to accept your word and to begin to follow it. Scripture says that if we would confess our sins and we would believe in our heart that he is faithful and just to forgive us of all sins, to reconcile us where we've been divided. Heavenly Father, I pray for anyone in earshot this morning that feels divided from you. And I just pray that right now, through the power of your spirit, that you have let them see just how much you love them and how you desire to be in relationship. And God, that nothing is worth letting stand between us to divide us. Would you unite hearts with you? Father, I also pray for our congregation, for our church family, for us as Christian believers. God, you prayed that we might be one. Lord, could we become the fulfillment to that prayer? Lord, that no matter what differences may come our way, no matter what disagreements we may experience, we have the Holy Spirit of God within us to unite us together. Lord, when the temptation comes to let the enemy have his way, I just pray that you give us the strength and the courage. God, that you would let us be a community in unity, united in our faith in you and our love for one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.